Okay, John Maxwell said, if leadership is about influence, then everybody has leadership potential. Okay? You know, when you walk on the street and you choose to walk on the pedestrian lane, you're influen influencing others to do the same. When you jaywalk, you will tend to influence others to follow your example, right? Right? You see, we all exert influence every day, everywhere. In our home, when you wake up in the morning and you say, Good morning! And then everybody brightens up because of that cheerful greeting, you are influencing them. That's leadership. You understand that? The negative side of leadership, you enter into a room of joyful people and you start talking about bad news. Why? Wow, you're influencing them to change their attitudes, right? See, everybody influences people every day to a certain level. That is why all of us have potential leadership. You understand that? It's just a matter of focusing that power of influence, inten making it intentional, influencing people towards what is good, influencing people towards what is right, influencing people to do what is right or to accomplish a certain objective is leadership. Okay? And since everybody exerts influence every day with people, you simply have to focus and be intentional about creating the most positive influence you can. That's what it means to be a leader. Understand that? So that is a generic understanding of leadership that applies to everybody. Okay? So we have seen our proposed definitions of leadership. Lahat po yung tama. <laughs> Kasi lahat po yung lalabas rin sa ating discussion this afternoon. Okay? Now, what I'm going to share with you is simply an introduction to the topic, no? I have been discussing this leadership and management in many companies in Manila, big companies including uh, Titanium Group of Companies, also talk with uh, another business company, I forgot the name, it's been so many years ago. Also with uh, Benison Group of Companies, this is the Abinson, Walter Martz, uh, Electro World, uh, this is the Benison Group of Companies. And uh, the Lord gave me an opportunity to uh, provide consultancy seminars from the top, from the Execom, Mancom, down to the rank and file, in a series of seminars covering a number of months, okay? So I was invited by the President to do the seminars after he heard me give a message at the Rotary Club in Makati that, that my focus was building a nation of character. How do we build a nation of character? And we focus on the family, we focus on healing damaged identities of people, we focus on exercising leadership in management, it's just, instead of just management, okay? Exercise leadership in management. And so, one of the managers in the Benesic Group of Companies, who's a manager of Electro World Outlet in Greenbelt, when I visited that local business unit, she recognized and said, Dr. Magalong, thank you for visiting our SBU. Can I talk with you for a while? I said, sure. She said, you know, sir, what happened on sa mga seminars sa, sa headquarters is that we experienced a paradigm shift. All the time we thought management was this way. Now we realize marami, there are a lot of problems in our traditional management systems. And your lectures have helped us understand how we can integrate leadership in management in order to enhance the ability of management to inspire and motivate people to do a better job. And said, I just wish that all the managers in the whole company will attend your seminars because some of them are still traditional. They're criticizing us, uh, you know, questioning why we are changing our method because of a seminar there in the headquarters. But, you know, sir, if you look around in our SBU right now, look at our employees. They're all positively motivated. I was surprised because when I entered that Electro World shop, everybody was greeting me, all the salespeople. Hi, sir. They do not know me. They do not know I was the one who spoke in the company where the manager attended. So these are just rank and file. They don't know me. I said, oh, sir, would you like some coffee? You know, and, and they have never done that before. I mean, you get the full attention of all the sales force. And they're very positive. They try to affirm what they see in you. Sir, I like your t-shirt. I, I like your polo shirt. That is, those are the things I taught them. Learn to affirm people, okay? And so they felt this was very effective and they, they've started to do a once a week affirmation circle. And the manager told me, sir, you know, since we started that, we do that every Friday before we close shop. 
no? or after we close shop, we gather together in a circle and then small circles, marami kami, and then we start affirming one another. Sir, alaki po talaga ng pagbabago sa attitude ng mga attitude of the workers, the relationship with each other. You know, intrigue, jealousy started to diminish. There's a growing respect na among the personnel, and you will hear less fightings among the personnel. It's amazing, sir, what that ha what what that accomplished in our company. And so what I'm sharing with you are principles that work. These are principles that help enhance, you know, relationships in traditional management, particularly as practiced by companies in Manila. So what we're going to talk today is simply an introduction because the entire thing is a course. This is really a course. But we're going to just, just focus on the introduction so you'll understand the basic principles that make you an effective leader and also a great manager. Okay, how many of you are managers here in your workplaces? Anybody who's a manager here? Okay, how many of you here uh, are leading a ministry in this church? In the sense you're also a manager. Okay, so we will talk about these things and understand what is leadership, what is management, what are the differences between the two, and how do you integrate leadership into management in order for it to be very effective with people. Okay, are we ready to learn new things? Okay, let's take a look at our outline. Here we are. First of all, we will go into definitions. This is a basic definition or generic definition of leadership. Can we read it together? Leadership is any exercise of moving people towards an intended goal. This is a task-oriented definition given by secular leadership science, okay? So it is an any exercise of moving people towards an intended goal. How many of you are doing that? Okay, you're moving people towards an intended goal, okay? But we have to understand the salient parts of this definition. First of all, focus on the word moving people. Okay, moving can either be command and control, okay, it could be simply by influencing the person, persuasion, or by agreement, okay? So how do you move people towards an intended goal? Number one, command, dictate what to do, right? That's traditional management, okay? Second is, you try to influence the person by your, by your example to move towards the same direction or to do the same thing, okay? So that's one way you move people by your example, by influencing them. You can also influence by your words, words of advice, okay, to them, or words of counsel. So when you do that, you're influencing them to move in a particular direction in order to meet a particular goal. For example, you're counseling a friend, they had a quarrel, you know, with, the, with their mother, you know, she's coming to you asking for advice, you advise her, she follows your advice, she asks forgiveness from her mom and reconcile. So you're actually exercising what is called influence, okay? And you're helping the person, moving the person from where the person is towards where God wants him to be. That is reconcile with your mom, ask forgiveness, apologize, etc. So that is an exercise of leadership based on the definition that leadership is influence. You understand that? Thirdly, you can move people by persuading them, persuading them. Instead of commanding, persuade, show them the benefits, why this should be done. Give them a vision of why this thing can benefit a lot of people. So persuasion is one way of moving people. The other one is by agreement. That means you see a problem, you agree that this is the solution to the problem, so you work together based on that agreement to do the job, and you're the one taking leadership to ensure that the agreement is being carried out. You understand that? So there are many ways of moving people towards an intended goal. There's not only one, okay? Traditional management is command and control. That's traditional management, okay? Now, the ethics of whatever method is used is defined differently by different schools of thought. For example, for some schools of thought, command and control is ethical. Whether you tend to be abusive of another person, because you're trying to take control of a situation, and so you say, if you don't do that, you, know, you can humiliate the person, shame him publicly, that's part of command and control, right? In order for him to do the job. So anything is justified. You understand that? So the question is, is that ethical? Is it ethical to publicly humiliate an employee or a subordinate 
because has not done a good job in order to push him to do it right by publicly shaming him. Okay, that's command and control. There, the leader does not care about your feelings, about your personal dignity as a human being, your worth as a person doesn't care about that. It's important to get the job done. Okay, that's command and control. Some question the ethics of that, right? Some say it's ethical because it gets the job done. They understand that, okay? So which one would you, would you side with? Those who say that that approach is unethical because it violates the human dignity of another human being? Or say it's ethical because no matter what it is, no matter how insulting it is, it gets the job done anyway. Do you understand this? To say how you move people, the ethics of God depends on what school of thought you're coming from. But since we come from a script, Christian perspective, okay, and that's what changes everything. We are exercising leadership as Christians, right? Right? The problem is that in, there are certain beliefs that dichotomize or separate the workplace from one's spirituality. In other words, when I am my company, I do it the company's way. I don't care if it's unethical or what. It gets the job done. Okay? You're a Christian. Well, my being a Christian is only for church. But when it comes to the company, I'll be as brutal as I can. When it comes to the church, I'll be kinder. You call that dichotomy. You tend to separate the religious from the secular. So in the religious, your style of leadership is, you know, more gentle, democratic, more understanding. When it comes to the company, it's brutal. As Christians, would you consider, you know, a, an approach of leadership that degrades the worth of other people ethical? That's where the conflict starts. Because there are some belief systems that says, separate business from spirituality. So business will do it the business way. Because it works. Do you agree? Can you dichotomize spirituality? Can you compartmentalize spirituality as only church, but not my professional life? I'm asking you the question, so you answer it in your own hearts. <laughs> okay? You see, we are approaching the topic as Christians. We come from the school of thought that believes that in the eyes of God, human worth and dignity must be upheld at all times. Amen? So, that is the concern about how do you move people. Okay? Secondly, our definition says any exercise of moving people towards unintended goals. So, there's a question about the intended goal. The intended goal can be imposed, okay? This is our goal, whether you like it or not, we're gonna do this, okay? That's one way. And in management, that's it. In management, science, and practice, whether they don't agree, this is the goal of the manager, just do it if they don't agree, because you're being paid to do it. So in the context of the corporate world, that is legitimate because you're being paid for the job, whether you agree or not with your boss. You understand that, okay? Now, the intended goal can be imposed or agreed upon. There are some companies who integrate leadership in management. Traditional management will just impose, this is our goal, whether you agree with it or not, you better do it or you lose your job. Tama. Well, that's what you're paid for. <laughs> that's legitimate from a business perspective. Yes, it's legitimate. You are here because we're paying you. If you don't do the job well, why should we pay you? You're here not because of uh, your identity. You're here because of your function. So if you do your function, we don't care about your identity. So long as you do your function, that's what you're being paid for. You're not being paid for because of your identity. Because of your function. It's what you do that is important in the company. It's not who you are. Do you understand that? That's why there's always a conflict, you know, in boards of churches between when you have business people in the board, and then you have a pastor in the board, you can expect, boom, there's going to be a clash. Because the values are different. The pastor upholds biblical values of relationships in church leadership. 
the, the business people were the Paul business values of leadership and management into the church. And there are certain areas where the view about how to deal with people conflicts between traditional management and church leadership. Kaya pag nag-aaway ang pastor at saka board member, normal yun. And that's why some pastors burn out from the ministry. Some of them resign, quit the ministry. Because they feel they, those who are business people in the board do not understand the values being upheld by the Word of God as church leaders. Because they value the business method, which means get the job done by whatever means. Don't care what the means are, so get the job done. You understand that? You see there's a, there's a conflict there? Okay, so the intended goal can be impressed or given. Let me tell you this, and this, is, this has started to happen in Benison Group of Companies. I told them, it's better to discuss goals with your rank and file. So they will appreciate the goals, and they will be, they will be persuaded that this is a good thing to do. It's worth all our efforts. So you discuss with them why these are the goals of the company. Why is this is the goal for the production department? Why this is the goal for the marketing department? And then help them appreciate it and make it an agreement. Because when it's agreement, they are motivated to make it happen. More than just imposed onto them. This is our goal. Whether you do it or like it or not, you do it or you lose your job, period. That's traditional management. But when you integrate leadership into management, you focus more on motivation. Motivation. So you bring out the best in every employee or every subordinate because he is inspired to do it. Not threatened or intimidated to do something. You understand this? Okay? So this is, ito yung paradigm shift that that mother was talking about because in traditional management, focus, get the job done at whatever expense. Now they have to learn, they have learned in the seminars I did with them, to value people, inspire them, make them part of the goal, make them part of the vision, and that will help them bring out the best. You understand that? Okay? Now, let's go on. So the intended goal can be imposed or agreed upon. A great leader will not really impose. He will make the people feel they're part of the vision and inspire them to agree, this is what we're going to do. It's no longer somebody forcing something on somebody, but something that everybody agrees, we will do this. Understand that? That's agreement. Okay, intended goals by agreement. Force upon or desired by those who led. So if you force it on them, that's one thing, it works, but it doesn't mean they will give you, your, the people will give you the best. They'll just give you according to the pay. You understand that? Because they don't feel valued in the process. Okay? So, it's either force upon them or they desire it because they have seen, maganda ito, this is good. We agree with you, sir. We will do this. It's, it's, it becomes their desire to make it happen. And so what happens, the output potential is greater. This is what I'm saying. When you integrate leadership in management, a paradigm shift takes place. Traditional management has had so many problems for many years because they lack leadership. Talk more about that. Okay? So, in your ministries, you are doing management because you have to organize the group in order to get something done, right? You understand that? And you need to control. Sometimes the focus is more on controlling rather than motivating. You understand that? We'll see the distinctions in a little while. Okay, so intended goal could be imposed or forced upon or agreed upon and desired by those led. It can either be ethical or unethical. The goal could be ethical or it can be unethical. The goal means we have to sell even if it means deceiving the people. You know, deceiving advertisements. Okay? So, are mutually beneficial. Thirdly, the relationship between leader and follower are, can vary 
from autocratic, that's coercive and dictatorial. I'm a leader. I'm your leader. You better obey me or else. Yan yung autocratic type of leadership. Pag hindi mo kasi nanood, sasermonan kita. You got that? If something happens, I be, you can be sure I'll blame you. That's coercive and autocratic type of leadership. Okay? But there's another way of leadership where the relationship is more democratic, non-coercive or participatory. For example, if you're part of a you have a team, you're leading a team in the church, or you lead a team in your company, you can just say, this is what we're going to do, okay? And you agree or not? <laughs> okay, that's autocratic approach. It doesn't always work, especially when you're dealing with groups that are, are voluntary. Like in a church. In a church, people serve voluntarily. You don't, you, don't, you don't pay for their services. Now, if you exercise autocratic type of leadership, some people may not feel good about with you. They will get hurt by you and they will quit. And you can stop them from quitting because you're not paying them anything anyway. Right? So, for churches, the better approach is not autocratic leadership, but democratic. Participatory. Except, okay, for example, we're developing policies in the worship team on discipline. Instead of the head, like Don, writing down ito yung discipline and boom! Itong discipline policy natin, whether you like it or not, submit. That's autocratic leadership. In other words, the people, the worship team did not have an opportunity to participate in the molding of the policy. You understand that? The other way is democratic leadership, like in your youth group. Instead of one leader telling the people, this is what we're going to do, okay, this year, this is how we're going to do it. <laughs> That's autocratic leadership. With voluntary, in a context of voluntary, uh, volu voluntarism, that doesn't always work effectively. You understand that? Because some people may not like what, how you're doing it. Okay? So it's better participatory. Mas, it's better for the ideas to come from them. And if you have I, I, something you would like to form as a policy or as a program, you ask them, what do you think about this? Let them contribute and let them participate in the shaping of the goal. You understand that? Because when you're participating, it, it, it comes from them, they will be motivated to do it. That is what you call democratic leadership. Even in the family, exercising your role as a father or a mother can be autocratic or democratic. As a leader of your family, you can be boom, boom. If you don't, boom, 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 like that, right? Sometimes too much military style. And I tell you so much damage has happened to children who were reared up in a military style of leadership from their dads. They're so damaged. You understand that? Or it could be participatory. Why? Because as a father, I want to prepare my children to become independent one day. I have to train them how to think and make decisions. If I don't involve them in the decision making, then I'm not training them to be independent. I'm training them to be dependent on me forever. Because I'm the one thinking for them all the time. I'm the one imposing them on what they should do with their life. I'm the one telling them this is how to do it. But I never ask them to participate. So how can they develop ability to make decisions? Because it's always the father making the decisions for everybody. Are you still here? So even in the family, is your leadership autocratic or democratic? Autocratic develops dependence of the children on the parents for their decisions. Well, democratic trains them to make good decisions. Because it's participatory. Do you understand this? So these principles apply in the home, in your ministry, in your company, in your business, it applies. You understand that? If you want to bring out the best in people, bring out their best potentials and strengths, make them part of the decision making. So that they will be the one to decide also what are the consequences. Right? The leader can autocratic said, if you don't do this, this is the consequence, okay? I say, okay, Brad, let's talk about this. If this fails, what will be the consequence? Sir, I did, I know. Suspended. Oh, came from them, good. 
sir, fired out. Came from them. <laughs> Do you understand that? Because sometimes labor does not understand management. There's always a conflict between management and labor, right? The employees and the employers. Always conflict between the leader and subordinates because the subordinates does not understand the frame of thinking of the leader. Because it's always impose, impose, impose. Even if they don't understand. They're forced to submit. Are still here. That's traditional management. You understand that? Leadership is something else. Are, are, are you getting where I'm going? Okay? Are you beginning to remember situations and examples in your experiences in different places about this? Yes. Okay? So, that is why it's important that the relationship between leader and those that are led should be more democratic with its non-coercive and participatory style, especially with groups where people are just volunteers. Now, if you are working with people who are paid, and you can, of course, you have all the rights to be autocratic if you think you know everything about the business. If you think you know everything ha about how to make things work the best. I mean, if you're, you feel you know everything, you can be autocratic, right? And uh, the rank and file that people recognize, you're really wise, you're very good because everything you decide really works, right? Right? But it's not building them. It's not making them better decision makers because they are never participating in the decision making act. Just like children, kung puro impose, 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 walang participation yung bata, hindi matututo mag-isip, mag-analyze, hindi matututo gumawa ng good decisions, maiwasan ng mga wrong decisions. Kasi they are not thinking, the parents are thinking all the time for them. That is autocratic leadership. Are you still here? So, in our context as Christians, there are times autocratic leadership works if the people trust in the leader absolutely. That is the only context where it will work. If the people trust their leader absolutely, you can be autocratic and they will respond positively to that. Right? right. So there are times it works. But there are times democratic works better because it draws out the best in people. The disadvantage with democratic style, sometimes those that you're leading may impose on you <laughs> or, or oppose you because you're giving the freedom to participate. So they have the right to oppose you. That's the problem with democratic style of leadership. In autocratic style, it depends on opposition or a goodbye. <laughs> right? So both have advantages and disadvantages depending on your context. As I tell you, autocratic styles only work effectively when there is absolute trust in the hearts of the people in their leader, like Jesus. Jesus tends to be autocratic in his relationship with the disciples. And it works because they trust him. Right? But there are times it's also democratic by asking them questions. Yes, Jesus exercised both autocratic and democratic styles of leadership. Okay? So, I want you to think about this carefully because this defines the kind of relationship between leader and the led. Am I going to exercise autocratic leadership with these people? Question, do they trust me? 100%. If not, soon you will have problems with them if you use autocratic way. You understand that? Okay? Now, if you are a business leader and you want to, to bring out the best in your people, you can include some democratic approaches at times to develop their decision-making. Like for example, what I taught in the Venice and the Cutting is when processing performance failures in their employees. So what do you do when your employer does something that hurts the business? Like failing to do his job well. Usually, there will be blame, 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 right? Or kicked out of the company, right? You know, people sometimes build a reputation of firing people. Some people build a great reputation on building them instead. You understand that? 
Okay? So what do I do when there's a performance? So, kaya, your son or daughter did something wrong. Simple as that. What do you do? Autocratic did they say, blame, 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 sermon, sermon, sermon. And then threaten. That's autocratic leadership. You do that to your children, you do that to your employees, you do that if you are a commander in the battlefield, of course you can do that to your soldiers. That's autocratic. How would be the democratic way? I tell my son or I tell my employee this, okay, can you tell me exactly what happened? Why did it happen? What was the mistake? Who is responsible for the mistake? So how do we correct the mistake? What should you do to correct the mistake? How do we avoid this from happening next time? You tell me. Alam mo, these managers that I trade in Venezuela Group started doing that. It's teaching the employee or your son to become more responsible for his actions. It's developing a deep sense of responsibility because you're making him think about what he did and think about what should be the consequences for what he did and make him think how we'll avoid it next time. You're the one, you're not imposing you are drawing it out from him, so he'll be motivated to do it because it's coming from him. Now let me ask you as parents, do you think that's more effective? That sermon, blame, cretin. It sounds like traditional management in the family, right? <laughs> but leadership is different. Leadership draws out the best in people. So you build them instead of fire them. You build them by helping them process what they have done. So they learn from it, and they themselves decide what to do with it. You don't decide for them, they make the decisions because you have successfully made them feel responsible for what they did. Are still here? So you see now the advantages and disadvantages of autocratic and democratic approaches? You understand that? So are the ministry leaders here? Are you learning something here in how you lead your group? Okay, so success in either type of relationship, whether autocratic or democratic, depends on the agreement of expectations between the leader and the ones led. If they expect you to be a commander, you can use autocratic approach. They will respond positively because they expect you to be that. But if they expect you to be more democratic and you're autocratic, you'll have a problem. So you have to know what are the expectations of the people that you are leading. How do you shape their expectations so they expect correctly? That's the job of the leader. It's to help establish the right expectations in the led, people that are being led. Are you learning something? Is this getting leadership more complicated? Or getting it more accurate? Okay, so you understand exactly what to do. You understand that, okay? So, autocratic leadership works in certain situations. Number one, when there's trust in the leader. Secondly, there is expectation from the lead that the leader is supposed to behave that way. And because it's expected, they respond to it positively, kahit na autocratic yung approach. You see those important elements. But if you are with a group, who expects you to be more democratic and you become autocratic, you'll have a problem. Or you have a group who's expecting you to be autocratic in full command and you're being democratic, they'll get confused. And later on they may say, they will oppose you. <laughs> they understand this. But in the context of church leadership, which method do you think works well? Autocratic or democratic? Why democratic? Because most people are just volunteers. They're not hired to do the job. You're not paying them for that. If they don't like you, goodbye. You gotta stop them. This is better democratic, participatory relationship between the leader and the lead. So you build them. When something goes wrong in your core leadership team, don't sermon, don't find family to blame, 
us what happened. Let everybody leadership process what happened. Why did this happen? What was the mistake committed? Why was it committed? What led to the mistake? So what are we going to do about this? How do we correct this? Who's responsible to correct it? How do we avoid this from happening next time? What do you, when you do that, what you're doing with your leaders, you're training them to be leaders. When you're autocratic, you're training them to be followers. Because you're not building them in their capacity to think and make decisions. You're the one deciding for them. It gets things done, yes, effectively, if they trust you and they expect that from you. But it doesn't make them better decision makers. You don't, you're not building leaders, you're building good followers. Are you still here? Are you sorting this? In the Bible, leadership is not about building just followers. As I said, average leaders produce followers. Great leaders produce leaders. Because whether you like it or not, you're not going to live forever. Who will continue what you have started if you have not trained others to be like you? Like a father to his son. If you're always imposing, imposing your decisions on your son, especially he's already a teenager, you'll have a lot of conflict with your son because he wants to be feel he's being treated as an adult because he believes he's becoming an adult and he has the right to think for himself. He has the right to decide for himself. And you're still imposing autocratic parin, you're going to have a clash. You are going to have a class with your teenager because a teenager thinks he's already adult and wants to be treated that way. Are you still here? So autocratic methods is going to create what? A problem with teenagers. When they were children, autocratic works. But when they're teenagers, it's not going to be effective anymore. It has to be democratic, participatory. Because you're training your son, your teenager, to think, analyze, avoid mistakes by processing his decision, and helping him develop wise decisions. Because you're making him think all the time. So when your children are teenagers, stop imposing your thinking on them. Train them to think, and to think right, through guided questions. Okay? So what do you believe? There's a problem in personal behavior, behavior of a personal, an employee, or a son, or a daughter, or a member of the leadership core. There's a problem of performance. So what do you do? Autocratic will be blame, sermon, threaten, right? Democratic will be process questions. So the person takes responsibility and solves the problem that he created. You're building him. You're teaching him to be a leader. Okay? We would like to encourage more democratic leadership. Because it builds people. There are times you will be autocratic. If you feel they trust you enough, you can be autocratic. No problem. If they expect you to be autocratic, no problem. As a pastor can say, Okay, brother, can you do this? Pastor, I, well... But because you say so, I'll do it. Because he expects me to be like that. So he'll respond positively. So you have to be sensitive to the people you're leading. What is their expectation of you in your style of leadership? Do they trust you? Have you made yourself trustworthy to them? Do you have the integrity that they can observe? As somebody said, it's not just influence. It's influence with integrity, correct? Because if they feel you can be trusted, you can exercise autocratic leadership, they'll bow to you because they trust you. So trust is important, proper expectations are important. Any question at this point? We're just at the definition. Are you learning something? My prayer is that all of you will be great leaders. Great leaders produce leaders. Okay, we'll see that later on. Okay, let's go now to the specifics. 
I used the word dynamic. I said leadership dynamic. Why did I use the word dynamic? Because the word dynamic means something that causes or motivates change or growth in something or someone else. So leadership dynamic means a leadership that continues to motivate change and growth among those who are being led. You call understand leadership dynamic, okay? The reason why I refer leadership dynamic because the focus is on the dynamic, <laughs> okay? We, are talk, we can talk about leadership, and there are so many schools of thought about leadership. There are so many uh, concepts about leadership, okay? I'm not going to talk about leadership alone. I'm talking about the dynamic, because that is the biblical perspective. Leadership must change lives. That's why, the, that's why God establishes leadership on earth, so that it will affect change in lives of people. You understand? So we call it a leadership dynamic. The focus is on the dynamic, okay? It describes the essential role of leadership, which is to motivate change and growth. This is Jesus' model. Jesus spent three years of his life, what? Focusing on building the character, attitudes, and perspectives of his 12 apostles. Let him understand his vision. Rebukes them many times for who's the greatest among us, you know? Most of the time, he's rebuking them for lack of faith or bad character. And that's the job of a leader. His job is to change the person. So he becomes effective in carrying out his purpose in the world. Understand that? Trials, according to the Bible, are meant to change you and qualify you for your destiny. Every test, every exam, whether it is written or practical, is intended to build in you the qualities necessary for you to be successful. Trials work in the same way. As James writes in James chapter 1, consider it pure joy when you experience all kinds of trials because you know the testing of your faith produces endurance, character. And you need that if you want to survive. Like a soldier in the battlefield. Pag hindi siya trained sa endurance, baka isang tama ng bala uuwi na sa mama niya. You got that? Okay. So, change and growth is the kind of leadership that transforms people's lives and makes them better people. People with greater and better character, people who have better skills. That is the kind of leadership that is dynamic. Yeah, exchange, okay? It involves leadership by example because you can never bring your people higher than yourself. You can only bring them at most to your level. John Maxwell calls that the law of the lead. I call that Jesus' model of discipleship. A disciple is a man to become like his master. Okay, we will see that in a little while. Okay? Can you read this? The main task of leadership involves moving and empowering people to successfully carry out an intended goal. Okay? Next. So let's go to what's management? It will sound a little similar. Management is the process of directing and controlling people to achieve organizational objectives or goals. The process of directing and controlling people to achieve organizational objectives or goals. Okay, that's a general definition of management. Specifically, and this is where the management exercise becomes more and more distinct from leadership. Okay? Management is a distinct process consisting of planning, organizing, actuating, and controlling in order to accomplish predetermined objectives. Okay? Clear what management is? It involves controlling people in order to get a job done. The means of control depends on the style of the manager. Okay? Whatever it takes <laughs> to get the job done. Okay? Now, distinctions between leadership and management. This is an article from the Academic Leader, September of 1994. It says, Our earlier belief that leadership comes about primarily through managerial ability, because before, leadership and management are often mixed together. And that leadership means being a good manager. Okay? It comes about primarily through managerial ability has been replaced by an awareness of skills needed for understanding people 
and dealing with their problems productively. The problem with traditional management is just impose, 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 get the job done, get the job done, and sometimes but whatever means. He wouldn't care if you're going through a crisis in your marriage right now and your husband, wife just left you. He wouldn't care if your son just died. Especially when there are pressed schedules that needs to be met. Sometimes family will be sacrificed to get the job done. Because that's what you're paid for. Especially when there is an urgency in meeting a particular business goal. It happens. I've talked with people like that in the corporate realm. Okay? So, but today is being replaced by teaching managers or leaders to develop skills of sitting down with people, helping process their problems productively so that it doesn't stand in the way of their performance. You see, that takes more time, that takes more effort, that takes more energy, but it brings out the best in your people. Remember, the secret to your organizational success are the people who are working with you. Without those people, you have no success. The people are the basic building blocks of your success. Without them, you have no success. How you relate with them, how you deal with them, how you train them, how you build them, or degrade them affects your capacity to succeed corporately. Tama? So, managers are now more encouraged to sit down with their people Deal, understand what they're going through and deal with their process productively so they're released from those obstacles and be able to perform to their utmost productivity. Are you still here? You cannot remove that because it, every people go through crisis, they go through problems, emotional, ano kung babaeng employee, nako, iniwan ng boyfriend, apektado yan, no? Kasi, you know, seven years, papakasal na, biglang naputol yung engagement. Traumatic sa babae yun. You go to office, you still want to work? You want to commit suicide, right? <laughs> Traditional management won't care about your situation. Get the job done. Okay? Leadership in management values the person. It takes time para ma-overcome your problem. That's what this is saying. Okay? Jack Welch say, another leadership expert, the world of the 1990s and beyond will not belong to managers who do, or those who can make the numbers dance, managers who can produce a lot of wealth, okay? The world will belong to passionate, driven, what? Leaders, okay? People who, who not only have enormous amounts of energy, but who can energize those whom they lead. Those are leaders. Okay? Next. Can we read this together? While there are similarities in both definitions, and there is an element of leadership role in management, and there is an element of management's role in the exercise of leadership, there are distinctions that have developed, particularly in secular leadership science, as a result of the impact, and this is what made change everything, between leadership practice and management practice are very similar. But until the last 20 years, there's been a shift in the leadership science. Because of the impact and influence of the role of spirituality and moral ethical standards in leadership theories. Before, leadership and management, get the job done, and I don't care what it takes. Because now, after decades of studying the effects of traditional management, they realize that many companies fail precisely because they want to get the job done at the expense of relationships. Because they will do anything to get the job done, even at the expense of their personnel. Are you still here? What happens? Many companies have lost good people who could have made them successful. Rebellion takes place in the organization. Strikes and rallies. The workforce begins to not perform according to standard because relationships are being violated. So what happens? Productivity of the company begins to go down. Are they learning? Yes, they're learning. There is a role of mora for morality in management. Spirituality. Spirituality is what makes you value people. 
because you see them as creatures made in the image of God like yourself. Human dignity, the value of human dignity is uh, influenced by spirituality. And doing things right is the influence of morality. So spirituality and morality entering into the management and leadership sciences has changed the paradigms. There's a shift. Understand that, okay? These are the points of debate, okay? That will help us now to see how leadership and management have now begun to branch out separately, okay? Because of these questions. The question is, what is effective sometimes is in conflict with what is ethical? And what is ethical sometimes is in conflict with what is effective. Number one question in leadership circles that has really changed the paradigms or the concepts about leadership. Number one, sometimes what is ethical is effective. That's true. If you, do, if you treat your people, if you lead your subordinates in ways that do not violate moral standards, no cheating, no dishonesty, no manipulation or, you know, you follow integrity, you follow compassion. In other words, you adhere to moral standards of integrity in everything that you do, okay? He said, is effective. Why? Because a leader who is a person of integrity, who will never bring down another fe fellow worker, okay? definitely will be effective because the people will get the job done because they trust their leader because they know him to be a man of integrity sometimes what is effective is ethical this is from a secular definition in the secular traditional management science if it's effective it's ethical no matter what it takes what is ethical is defined by the results if you get good results, whatever it means you did, dishonesty, whatever, it's ethical because it gets the job done. For that particular perspective, ethical means effective. And therefore, in other words, the end justifies the means. Because you get the job done, even you use dishonesty, uh, you deprive a per, as an employee of their human rights, you know, you bring down, you degrade another human being because of poor performance, okay? That's, that's again, whatever I'm doing is ethical because it gets the job done. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with what is effective is ethical, no matter what it takes? Do you agree? As Christians, we don't. There's a tension. Because there are some companies who follow this. What is effective is what is ethical. For example, there are companies that teach their employees never admit your wrong to your clients. Have you encountered especially banks, who will never apologize to you, who will never admit they did something wrong. In, in the legal profession, right? what is effective is ethical. You agree with this? If you're in a company that practices this, I wouldn't be surprised if you want to leave later on. Because today what works is ethical, regardless of what it took, regardless of the means. You got that? Okay, here's another one. These are the four questions of debate. Third one is the opposite. Sometimes what is ethical is not effective. That's true. In business, integrity doesn't sell. Especially how the world is doing it. You have to do a little cheating to get ahead of the race. Right? Compromise a little bit in order to gain more income. Uh, be dishonest about your advertisement so you get more customers believing your advertisement so they'll buy your product. Right? Putting up, you know, promotion posters about an event, promising something but it does not deliver. <laughs> okay? Sometimes, 
What is effective is also not ethical. That's what I'm talking about. And vice versa. If you're always very honest, sometimes it won't work. Are you seeing the tension here? As a leader, how would you, how would you deal with your people who are asking questions about BAR compliance? You're a leader and you're a Christian. You uphold what is ethical more than what is effective, right? But if you are too honest, they will take advantage of you and charge more than you as required from your income because you're too soft. You got that? So many of us experience this struggle. Sometimes what is ethical is not effective. <laughs> okay? Especially those working in companies that practice all of these types of under the table, cheating, whatever. It's so hard to survive when you're a Christian. Are you still here? But does that mean that God's ways don't work? It's just a matter of time. I have heard the testimonies of brethren in Christ who had to resign from a company because they're doing this honest work and they cannot contain it anymore so they decided to quit. You list a very high income but you maintain your integrity, right? You know what happens? There are some of them, I don't know what happened to the others, some of them who because of their very good record were hired by companies that pay bigger companies that believe in the value of integrity. Can I tell you this? Important statements. Sometimes doing things God's way at first will fail, but it will ultimately succeed. Because you have the favor of God in you because you're doing it God's way. And here's another statement. Doing something that is not God's way or doing something the world's way may at first seem to succeed but you will ultimately fail. Now, which one do you prefer? <laughs> you know why? Look at companies that use deception in their advertisements. Later on, somebody will sue them. And if the suit becomes successful, the reputation of the company goes down. In the end, it defeats them. It destroys them. Because they did not pursue their business with integrity. You understand that? Remember, the number one uh, the number one um, resource, uh, the number one source of income of any business is the trust of the people in you and in your products. I'll call that the number one source of success in business is the trust of people in you and your product. Because you will have success that will endure for a long, long time. I am not impressed by people who are successful overnight because 10 years from now, I don't know if they will still be there. Especially those who became successful purely out of ability without character. It takes only ability to bring you to the top. Remember that. But it takes a lot of character to keep you there. And being able to stay on the long term is the most challenging thing in life when you want to maintain your position. You understand that? So in the end, what is ethical ultimately is effective. Ultimately, what is ethical ultimately is the effective one. If you want enduring success, build your business on integrity. And you will have your success outlive you for a long, long time. Because people's trust are critical to the success of your business. Once they lose the trust, you go bankrupt. So doing things God's way at first may seem to fail, but you will ultimately succeed because the favor of God is on you. Are you still here? Okay? So that's the question. From a Christian perspective, a good leader is both ethical and effective a balance that is indeed challenging to achieve and maintain. As a church leader, if I want to get a goal, the, a goal of the church you know, realized, I have to lead people to make it happen, right? You understand that? 
But I have to be good to them. I have to respect them. Right? I cannot degrade them. You understand that? Because if I do, their motivation to be part of, of, the, of the work diminishes. Because they feel they're being degraded. You understand this? Okay? So, it's so hard when you want to be ethical all the time. Because not all the time ethical is effective. But listen to this, that's only temporary. Ultimately, you will succeed because God's with you. You understand this? But where there is a conflict, but where conflict arises between the two, the Word of God teaches that leadership is primarily ethical by definition and standard, not effective. Who defines effectivity in Christian leadership? I'll give an example. In the eyes of the apostles, Jesus failed when he died on the cross. They were measuring the success of Jesus their Messiah by his coming against Rome, defeating Rome, and reestablishing the independent kingdom of Israel. They were looking for a political Messiah who will challenge Rome, defeat them, and bring back the dynasty of David with a Messiah, the descendant of David, ruling over them as an independent nation, not as a colony of the Roman Empire. That to them was the Messiah. And so when they saw Jesus voluntarily allowing himself to be arrested and allowing himself to be crucified, to them, he failed. He was ethical, but he was not effective from the world's point of view. But not in the eyes of God. Remember this, when you are serving God, the results belong to Him. Your job is to do what is ethical and leave the results to God. Amen. You understand that? Ezekiel, as again, is an example of a failed prophet. God told him, Ezekiel, I want you to preach to a people who are hard-hearted and stiff of neck. Tell them, warn them, prophesy to them, and I promise you, no one will listen to you. What a prescription for failure, right? He said, come on, preach, preach, preach. But I promise you, they will never listen to you because they're hard-hearted and they are stiff-necked. If you were Ezekiel and you have the job description with the expected result, would you still say, yes, Lord? What a miserable life. You're going to sacrifice your life. They can kill you as a prophet because they kill prophets like you. You're putting your, line, your life on the line and God says you will never succeed. You just do it anyway. Who measures success? What is effective? Who defines what is effective? God later on explains to Ezekiel why. He says, I want you to do this even if they will be obstinate and refuse to obey you. So that when I bring judgment on them, they will never tell me, you never warned us. Because I told you so. He said, that they will know that a prophet has been among them. Which means when judgment falls upon them, they cannot blame me for not warning them because a prophet has been among them. But they did not listen. That's your job description. Preach! Don't expect them to hear listen to you. Your job is to let them know, I told you so. So in the eyes of God, what is effective? That Ezekiel will be effective in delivering the message so that God later on can say, I told you so, Israel. You got that? In your service of God, only God defines what is effective. Your job is to do the ethical all the time. All the time. Do the ethical. Do what is right in the eyes of God, no matter what people think or say. Even if you'll endanger a program, but do what is right. This is a Christian leadership. And we obey God. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's a disciple. That's a leader. You understand this? That's the difference that we have. Leadership is primarily ethical by definition and standard. Christian leadership is defined by good moral example. Peter teaches a leader leads by example. In your business, do you lead by example? In terms of your character. Oops, pastor. Lagi ko sinisigawan sila are you a Christian first or a businessman first? 
in the kingdom of God is not the success of your business that will be brought on the day of accounting. It is your character that will be brought into accounting one day. So please don't be confused. You are a Christian first and only second a businessman. You are a Christian first and only second a commander in the army. You are a Christian first and only second an officer in the military. Because in the end, you will be judged not on the effective, but on the ethical. Are you still here? God determines what is effective, not you, when you serve Christ. Amen. Okay, now. Secular management, science, and practice, on the other hand, is primarily concerned with what is effective more than what is ethical. That's the, where modern leadership theories, particularly what is called transformational leadership, which I will be introducing in a while, begins to divert from management. Understand that? Okay? In practice, Management sometimes is driven to get things done at the expense of character. Often bad attitude and character are justified. Ibang masungit na manager? Well, sir, uh, you know, Dr. Magalong said, by being masungit is effective because they are terrorized to do the job. I said, of course. Okay, and they're getting paid. They don't want to lose their jobs, right? But I said, Mom, you want to see your employers give you the best, the best that they can give? Inspire them. Build them. And they will do things not because they fear you. They will do things because they love you. And they will walk the extra mile for you. Would you like that? I make him masungit na manager. I think of that, but I think about that, Dr. Magano. Okay. Bad character, you know, you know, bullying people in the company, you know, degrading them publicly, they call that management style. <laughs> okay. Well, it works. They get the things done, but they hate their boss. Okay, it doesn't build positive relationship, enab enabling them to give their best to the company. Okay, people, it's also at the expense of people. People are degraded. There is no, there's no more respect for the intrinsic worth and dignity apart from their performance. People's value can never be finally measured on their performance because people's value are intrinsic. Because they're created the image of God, even though they don't perform well, their worth is enough for Jesus to sacrifice his life for them. Understand that? Will you exchange straw for gold? Straw for gold. Straw. You have gold, I have straw. Can I buy your gold? If you're the gold seller, what would you say to the person? He's giving you a piece of straw to buy your gold. What would you say? Are you crazy? There's no equal value. Now let me ask you this question. Why would Jesus exchange his life for yours? If you are just true. Why would the Son of God, the darling of heaven, the most loved by the Father, worshipped by angels from eternity, adored by all the heavenly beings, why would he exchange his life for yours? Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, rebels, ugly, offensive, insulting, Christ died for us. In other words, God based your worth not on your performance. God upheld your worth despite your failed performance and is so worth in you enough to exchange his life for you so you'll be spared the eternal judgment that your failure deserves. This is human worth from God's perspective, not from the corporate management perspective. Every human being has dignity even if they fail in performance. It does not diminish their human worth 
just because they made a failed performance. Are you still here? Okay. That's why in secular management, they don't care about your dignity. Get the job done. You got that?